Good evening and welcome to Good Friday service here at East Liberty Presbyterian Church. I'm Randy Bush, the senior pastor, and with me are our organist, music director, Ed Moore, and soloist, David Jennings Smith. And Tim and Wayne are helping with our live stream. For this season, this is how we are having to do church. And so we remind you to go to our website at elpc.church for information about services and events coming up. We have tonight's service that at the end of which there'll be a Zoom discussion that you can take part in. You'll see information on it in the final slides of tonight's service. And then on Easter, we will be back with two services, an 8.45 Zoom service and then an 11 o'clock live stream service from here in the chancel. So go to our website. You can see at the base of the home page in the red box links to all the information about upcoming events and worship times. Good Friday evening services are designed to be somber occasions. They recall the day of Jesus' death. Death on the cross, burial in a borrowed tomb. They are usually held in churches with no extra color or decorations around. And they happen often when the shadows of evening have chased away the light of the earlier day. During this season of the coronavirus epidemic, a time of illness and of tragic loss of life, Good Friday may be harder than ever to celebrate. And that's understandable. It's never been an easy story to retell or an easy service of worship. But its message is a crucial one to our larger message of faith. Because worship that is shaped by somber texts and themes reminds us that God is with us always, through all the times of our life, especially those times that are hard and dark and difficult. So we'll retell the passion story once more this evening but in our time together, I will try to focus on glimpses of light that push back against the darkness of this day. For the crucified one that we honor is also the one whose resurrection and new life gives us hope for tomorrow. So friends, we are not alone. So now from Hebrews 10, we'll begin our worship with a call to worship that is a responsive reading. Let us approach God with a true heart and full assurance of faith, and let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for the one who has promised is faithful. It is before this one we gather, before this God, made known as our creator, redeemer, and sustainer, that we come together to worship, remember, and offer our praise. On this Good Friday night, then, let us begin with a word of prayer. Let us pray together. Almighty God, look with mercy on our family who have gathered this evening, your children for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, to suffer death on the cross, and who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. O Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. Our first hymn is the familiar Lenten hymn, when I survey the wondrous cross. And we'll sing three verses. Oh. 
I read from Hebrews chapter 10. That same passage offers these additional words of faithful comfort. It says, if we call on the name of the Lord our God, God will remember our sin no more. So on this night in which we recall Christ's sacrifice on the cross for our salvation, let us humbly take time to remember our debts, our trespasses, our sins against God and against one another. And invite you to join in this time of prayer as we say together the prayer of confession. Lord Jesus Christ, how well you know our hearts, and still you love us. We have denied you and denied our calling to serve one another. We have betrayed you and betrayed your commandment to love one another. Pour out your spirit of grace upon us. Teach us to love and serve you faithfully even as we love and serve one another by the example you have set for us. Hear now our silent prayers of confession. And now the assurance of God's forgiveness. Friends, do not despair. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, understands our human experience and sympathizes with our weakness. He is our Redeemer, our Savior, our hope this day and always. Trust and believe that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Amen. Monday, Thursday is that day in the Holy Week in which we remember the night that Jesus gathered in the upper room with his disciples when he washed their feet and gave them a new commandment to love one another as he had loved them. He said, one of you will betray me, one of you will deny me. And then he transformed the Passover meal into a communion of his own body and blood something to be done in remembrance of Him. Once the meal was finished, Scripture says that they sang a hymn and then they left the room. They left Jerusalem and they went outside the city to the Mount of Olives. And there Jesus would pray in the evening shadows. And within a few hours, soldiers being led by Judas Iscariot would come to arrest Him. In the early hours of the next day, Jesus would be tried by the religious leaders. And then he would endure the events of Good Friday itself, a trial before Pilate, 
the whipping, humiliation, and crucifixion outside the city walls. A tragic death. And then a hurried burial in a borrowed tomb, just as the sun was beginning to set. But I want us to go back to Monday, Thursday for a moment. What Scripture doesn't tell us is what happened in the upper room once Jesus and the disciples left. The Passover meal was complete. Dishes and goblets had to be cleared away and washed. The floor would have been swept and the furniture put back in the way it was before this large group of 13 had crowded together around a long table. Now perhaps it was the homeowner's family who did this work. Perhaps it was servants. None of them in the house knew what was about to happen out there among the trees on the Mount of Olives. To them it was simply another year's Passover celebration. Another opportunity to tell that familiar story of slavery in Egypt and then God's liberating power, God's deliverance into freedom. A story told over bread and salty water and spiced fruit and cups of wine. It's worth remembering that among the moments of the mundane, the miraculous is also close at hand. A house was open to Jesus of Nazareth and his disciples. Yet in that same moment, it hosted the Son of God and the beginnings of the entire Christian church. Plates and goblets were left behind. Simple utensils to be once more washed and dried and put away to be used another day. And yet those same utensils would bear the very first communion meal. Even in the mundane, the miraculous is close at hand. During this season of home isolation, of acts that are done repetitively day after day, as we move around the restricted spaces of our homes, I want you to remember this upper room a space made sacred by Jesus' presence. Think about the utensils and the cutlery used for that first communion that would actually be returned back to common use in that home. All of that was part of God's plan then. The ordinary transformed to the extraordinary. It was true then. It is true now. It was true in that room. It is true in our homes. We'll talk more about this in a moment. For now, we'll hear first Bach's beautiful arrangement of the tune that we have come to know as O Sacred Head, Sore Wounded. And then we will hear the gospel description of the Good Friday crucifixion and Jesus' death on the cross that afternoon.
Hear now our gospel lesson for this evening, a reading from John chapter 19. Then Pontius Pilate handed Jesus over to be crucified, and they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to a place that is called the skull. In Hebrew, is called Golgotha. And there they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross, and it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near to the city, and the inscription was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. And they also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who shall get it. This was to fulfill what Scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. And then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. And after this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop, and they held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. And then he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll hear now the song, Take My Mother Home. him say when he was struggling up the hill I think I heard him say take my mother think I heard him say when they were spitting in his face I think I heard him say take my mother home then I'll die Take my mother home, I'll die easy, take my mother home. I think I him say when they was ruffling off his clothes I think I heard him say take my mother home I 
but think I heard him cry when he was nailing in the nails. I think I heard him cry. Oh, take Tidy stairs on Calvary Ain't gonna die no more, Lord I'll die on Calvary Ain't gonna die no more, brother No more. I'll die easy. Take my mother home. I'll die so easy if you take. I think I heard him say when he was dying on the cross. I think I heard him say, Take. I think I heard him cry when he was giving up the ghost. I think I heard him cry. Beloved people of God, as Jesus stretched out his arms and gave up his spirit on the cross to bring life and salvation to all, let us come together in a prayer of intercession for ourselves and this world that God loves so much. Let us pray. We pray for the church throughout the world and right here. Almighty and eternal God, you have shown your glory to all nations in Jesus Christ. By your Holy Spirit, guide the church throughout the world to serve you faithfully, to proclaim your gospel, bring the good news of salvation to all people. Strengthen and uphold pastors and educators, musicians, mission workers, chaplains, and all church leadership. Keep them in health and safety for the good of the church. And may we each do the ministry work to which you have called us, loving others as Christ first loved us. We pray for people of other faiths. Gracious and inclusive God, you are at work in every land and among all peoples here on earth. So bring an end to all interreligious strife. Help us to honor the spiritual wisdom in all its forms and be partners in the work of spiritual healing you have set before us. Grant that all may recognize the signs of your grace active in this world and whatever their professed beliefs, as well as their honest doubts and disbelief. May your light and your love and your mercy rest upon all of us. We pray for your creation. 
Loving God, hold this world in the arms of your care. Heal the damage we have done and bring all things to fulfillment in you. We lift up our concerns regarding the spread of the coronavirus. May the air we breathe, the surfaces we touch, the space between us no longer fill us with fear, but by your merciful power once more be the place where our spirits and lives come together as the body of Christ connected here on earth. We pray for those who are ill or in need. Good shepherd of us all, give strength this day to the weary, especially those in the health care profession, the hospitality services, the cleaning and compassion ministries. Give healing to any that are ill or alone, isolated in hospitals or nursing homes, apartments or houses. Give comfort for those who battle with addiction, with anxiety, with stress of any source. And give your peace that passes all understanding and the grace to care for others as we would care for ourselves. For these concerns and the concerns on our hearts, O Lord, hear our prayers and draw near to us now as we offer the prayer taught to us by our Savior Jesus Christ. As we say together, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We'll hear now the hymn, Were You There? Oh, 
It causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? So hear now this gospel lesson for this evening from Luke chapter 23. These are the events that happened after Christ's crucifixion. Now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph who, though a member of the council, had not agreed to their plan and actions. He came from the Jewish town of Arimathea and he was waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God. Joseph went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen cloth and laid it in a rock-hewn tomb where no one had ever been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. And then they returned home and prepared spices and ointments. And on the Sabbath they rested according to the commandment. Earlier, I invited us to think about Monday Thursday, the upper room in which Jesus and his disciples had their last supper, and how after they left to go to the Mount of Olives, someone had to straighten up the space and clean up the table and wash the dishes and put everything back into their usual place. The mundane and the miraculous side by side in the same space. And just now I read from Luke chapter 23 about Joseph of Arimathea who went to Pilate and asked permission to take Jesus' body down from the cross. Now it was almost sundown and Jewish law forbade work on the Sabbath. So when Joseph received permission from Pilate, he and the others had to act quickly Scripture describes how Jesus was then placed in a tomb and the grave was sealed with a stone. The women disciples saw all this happen and memorized the location so that they could return there after the Sabbath time to finish the necessary burial requirements. But once again, Scripture is silent about what happened immediately after Jesus was laid in Joseph's tomb. It only says that the women, his followers, quote, rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment, according to the laws of Moses. It had already been a terrible, sorrowful day. The disciples had witnessed Jesus' unjust trial and barbaric crucifixion. And the women and the others had endured those long hours of him on the cross and heard Jesus' final words. 
before finally his torture ended and his body could be laid at rest. As darkness was threatening to fall, there was nothing more for them to do once the body was in the tomb than to hurry home. And so that's what they did, to observe the Sabbath and to, quote, rest according to the commandment. It's interesting to speculate what that Sabbath ritual at each of their homes might have felt like for the heartbroken followers of Jesus. They would have gone through the motions of what they had done every Sabbath evening. And hopefully they found comfort in the familiar acts of piety. They would have brought out water and bread and wine and candles. Two candles would have been lit as the sun went down. Because in that commandment, there are two parts. To remember and to keep the Sabbath. Once the candles are lit, they would have done the opening prayer. Baruch Ata Adonai Elohenu, Melech HaOlam. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, Sovereign of the universe, who has sanctified to us your commandments and commanded us to light the lights of Shabbat, the lights of Sabbath. After lighting the candles, then they would have said the Sabbath prayer, the Kadush. And it's usually spoken as they would hold a glass of wine. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu, Melech Haolam. And on the seventh day, God completed God's work and rested on the seventh day from all the work God had done. God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it God rested from God's work. Blessed are you who makes the fruit of the vine and through whose word all things exist. Blessed are you who sanctifies Shabbat. Amen. Then after that, the core part of the ritual was to wash one's hands. That is such a common thing for us to do now, especially in this season with the coronavirus. But it's something that has been done for thousands of years and has been included as part of the Sabbath rituals. And the process is simple. You pour water first over one hand and then over the other. And then you dry them to set them apart for what is to come next. Because the last element is to bless the bread. And again they would say, Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam. Blessed are you, our Lord and God, sovereign in the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Amen. And then in that moment, the bread is torn and it is shared and each person present takes a piece. And with that, the Sabbath day of rest has both been blessed and sanctified and then the meal can begin. Those four parts are actually a quite simple ritual. Now, I cannot imagine what was going through the women and men's minds on that evening as they did the Sabbath ritual so soon after witnessing Jesus' death. But in times of extreme shock and sadness, it is common to take comfort in what's familiar, in the mundane acts that we do so often without even thinking about them. And yes, in our lives there are daily deaths and losses, but life does go on. And thankfully, there are candles to be lit against the darkness and wine to be poured as a blessing and bread to be broken that it might nourish our bodies even in our times of need. The in-between days between Good Friday and Easter feel different and almost hollow. And the reality is we too are living in in-between times now. I've certainly felt that over the last days. All of our routines have been disrupted. Things that we value have been lost. Personal contact, workplace satisfaction, 
We worry about loved ones who are ill or at risk. We grieve the death of those taken by the virus. And yet we go through these in-between times because that's the only way to get where we want to be. Someone once said that running very slowly while crying is still moving forward. We put one foot in front of the other. We clear dishes and wash and put them away until it's time to take them back out again. And we light candles as the sun sets. And we lift a glass of wine. And we wash our hands yet again and we break bread so that all can eat. And we do it over and over again. The mundane and the miraculous side by side. There is comfort in this that is so familiar because God is here. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam. Blessed are you, the Lord our God, sovereign of the universe. All of our lives are different now. Our homes are suddenly schools and office buildings and places of isolation and quarantine. And uncertainty marks our lives in ways that we are far from being fully comfortable with. And we wait. We wait to reemerge. We wait to trust what we touch and whom we're beside. We wait to feel at peace. So my invitation to you this Good Friday night is to open your eyes and sense the presence of heaven in your midst, the mundane and the miraculous close at hand. For God is near and Jesus Christ is Lord. And though a time of waiting is upon us, it is not a long time, not long at all. For life is stronger than death, and hope will vanquish all despair. And in Christ, there's a love that will not let us go, ever. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you now to join in singing the Taze song, Within Our Darkest Night. At the end of this service, you'll see a slide that gives you the information for a Zoom discussion that you can join, an opportunity to talk one with another about Good Friday this year 
and your own thoughts and reflections. And our website at eopc.church has the information for not only the Easter services, but prayer services and other gatherings electronically in the coming days. But for now, our service concludes a few Sabbath candles push back against the darkness of Good Friday. And we wait. We wait as Jesus lies in a tomb, as disciples grieve and rest, as women count the hours until they can finish preparing the spices and go back to the cemetery to complete the interrupted burial rituals. It's not an easy time, but it is a sacred time because the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. We await Easter victory. We await once more the good news of Christ coming in glory. And while we wait, we are at peace. For we are not alone. Not now, not ever. For that, our response is, thanks be to God. Friends, go in peace. Amen.